born into this world begins a lifetime adventure of becoming and overcoming the challenges of human experience. We are led to faith, a spiritual experience which both guides and empowers us to choose the values which promote through action and reaction the development of human beings and human society. The need to meet and overcome experiences of injustice, oppression, animosity is part of the human environment. And perspective in understanding what goes on in life has helped me to meet the challenges of human experience more successfully and has counteracted the feelings of revenge and the susceptibility to hatred which comes so naturally. The courage and commitment to reject that which is false and unjust involves a transforming spiritual power. And it is in this sense, every human being is potentially the light of the world or its darkness. Dr. Helen Elsie Austin was an extraordinary woman whose place is secure in both the history of America and of the Baha'i faith. She worked tirelessly to break down the barriers to racial and gender equality at a time when Americans of African descent, not to mention women, were virtually invisible in most circles of society. Her life is a distinguished record of American firsts. The period in which my childhood and adolescence occurred was a climate quite different from what you know today. That was a time when there were no laws to protect the individual or a community of minority status. For an African American, there was a daily encounter with rejection, danger, and persecution based on prejudice and hostility. African American survival in this period was based on using the defenses they had developed during the period of slavery. They learned to pool their strength in their segregated schools and churches and other improvement organizations where they were able to develop and promote the spirit of self-help and to devise educational measures which stimulated a sense of self-worth and dignity and action to persevere in overcoming obstacles and to achieve excellence. Elsie was born in Tuskegee, Alabama in 1908. Her parents, George and Mary Austin, were teachers at the Tuskegee Institute and were dedicated to education as a tool for economic survival and civil rights. Perhaps their most profound teaching was done in the Austin home. Elsie's values were shaped largely by the family's long tradition of oral history the passing down from generation to generation, family stories of struggle and achievement. At pivotal moments in her life, Elsie drew inspiration and strength from the story of her maternal great-grandmother, Louisa Dotson. Though Louisa and her husband, Mentor Dotson, were both born into slavery, Mentor eventually ran for election and won a seat in the Alabama State House of Representatives. Mentor's election made him a target for the Ku Klux Klan. And there were few nights 
when he could get to his home and be with his family. As the story goes, one night, when my great-grandmother, Louisa, was alone with just her children, the clan came to her house, broke in the door. Pointing guns at her, they demanded that she tell them where her husband was. She looked them in the eye. She said, just go ahead and kill me because I will never tell you where he is. After more curses and threats and shots, they decided not to kill her and left. I was awed and inspired by that story, by her courage, a lone woman in a hostile, dangerous environment and her determination not to give in to injustice and oppression, even at the risk of death. And I have in certain incidents of my life been reminded and relied upon the memory of her courage and her strength. Historians refer to the period between 1900 to 1920 as the Great Migration. Within two short decades, more than 500,000 African Americans left the South for jobs and opportunity in northern cities. Eight-year-old Elsie was a part of that history. As her parents moved the family north to ensure their children had the best possible education, they settled in Cincinnati, Ohio, where Elsie was sent to an all-black elementary school. After grade school, Elsie entered Walnut Hill, a predominantly white high school. On her very first day of class, the teacher shared from a history book the contributions to civilization made by each of humanity's racial groups. The book plainly stated that not only had the black race made no significant contribution to civilization, but in fact, had been created to play a subservient role to the more fortunate races. Can you imagine two little black girls in a school full of white children, in a classroom full of white children, and with all the candor and cruelty of the young, the entire class looked at us. And there were, of course, a few snickers and grins. It was then that I remembered my grandmother. I felt as if the Klan was standing there with the guns trained on me. With great resentment and resolve, I stood up and said, I was taught in a black school that Africans worked iron before Europeans knew anything about it. I was taught that they knew how to cast bronze in making statues and that they worked in gold and in ivory so beautifully that the European nations came to their shores to buy their carvings and statues. That's what I was taught in a black school. There was an electrical silence. But friends, can you imagine, if there had been no protest, what ingrained prejudice and hostility would have been implanted in the minds of those children. And what humiliation and degradation would have been stamped upon us. In 1928, Elsie entered the University of Cincinnati as a member of the first integrated undergraduate class. When she arrived on campus, Elsie and seven other African-American women students were brought into the administrator's office. In that session, they were told not to be conspicuous, reminded that they belonged to a subject race, and advised to have low expectations for their academic success. We were young sensitive, full of hope and aspiration for university education, that speech traumatized us. 
We sat down and discussed the situation. And then all eight of us decided that we were going out for everything in the university. We almost took an oath in blood that we were all to finish that first year with honors in something. By the end of the year, each one of us did take an honor. And at the beginning of the next year, that same official who had called us in and insulted us apologized for her remarks. Not only did Elsie finish her undergraduate degree with honors, she became the first black woman to graduate from the College of Law at the University of Cincinnati and the first black woman to serve as Assistant Attorney General for the state of Ohio. While in school, Elsie pledged Delta Sigma Theta. The sorority is composed of professional women who are college graduates and is today one of the largest African-American women's service sororities in the world. Its mission is to provide assistance and support to black women, promote academic excellence, economic development, and political awareness. Elsie Austin served as the sorority's eighth national president from 1939 to 1944. During her tenure, Elsie was the driving force behind the Delta's Jobs Project, a national program aimed at providing black women with mentorship and professional opportunities. In Search of Sisterhood chronicles the history of the Delta sorority and refers to the Jobs Project as the first major undertaking that focused specifically on black women, elevating the Deltas to a new level of service. I remember at this point how I became a Baha'i. For Elsie, the mid-1930s was a time of spiritual introspection. I was young, angry, incensed, and hostile. I went to my father and I said, I'm going to become an agnostic or an atheist because I just don't believe anymore in these religions that are all separate, all fighting with each other, all enforcing prejudice against some group, and yet they say God is the father of all mankind. My father heard me out and then said, well, before you do it, why don't you go and talk to these Cincinnati people who are talking about the Baha'i faith? He was not a Baha'i, but he said they have some very interesting views and maybe that will interest you. So I went and talked to the Baha'is. I took their literature around for two years to find things to argue about. And my confirming experiences were the activities and the attitudes of so many wonderful Baha'is who helped me overcome my bitterness. There was Mr. Lewis Grayberry, who taught classes about the faith with culture, with gentility and forcefulness that impressed everybody. There was Dorothy Baker in Lima, an atmosphere which was like a setting for the Ku Klux Klan, so rigid and so mean. But Dorothy Baker opened her home for Baha'i firesides to which came black and white inquirers from surrounding areas who listened and became attracted to the teachings. Elsie found that the teachings of the Baha'i faith were consistent with her deep desire to contribute to the well-being of humanity. Dr. Austin shared her thoughts on this subject in an article stating, the religion of Baha'u'llah, founder of the Baha'i faith, begins with that essential spiritual regeneration of the human being which creates a heart for brotherhood and impels action for the unity of mankind. Elsie became a member of the Baha'i Faith in 1934 and just 12 years later was elected to the nine-member national governing body. In 1953, she moved to Tangier, Morocco to help establish the first Baha'i community in that country and to assist in the spread of the Baha'i faith throughout northern and western Africa. 
In 1960, Dr. Austin joined the U.S. Foreign Service and served 10 years in Africa as a cultural attache with the U.S. Information Agency. She initiated the first USIA women's programs on that continent, working with leaders and organizations in 13 African countries. As a result of those efforts, the USIA nominated Dr. Austin for the Federal Women's Award, and the University of Cincinnati gave her an honorary doctorate of humanities degree in 1969. In 2000, the university named a scholarship in her honor. Her outstanding story of service, spirit, and faith will undoubtedly inspire future generations to excel, succeed, and serve for years to come. The essential for peace is unity of conscience. Why? Because unity of conscience makes us willing to be just to give the other fellow his due. And I hope we will continue to work with all the inward and outward obstacles in developing that unity of conscience in ourselves and in all we can touch. The time for transformation is now. I think there is a Baha'i prayer that can offer us guidance strength, and determination. It is prayer, which talks about protest, it talks about faith, and it talks about progress. And it goes, quote, O oh God, aid thy servants to raise up the word, to refute what is vain and false, to establish the truth, to spread the sacred verses abroad, and to make the morning's light to dawn in the hearts of the righteous. And I don't know what we're waiting for, but we should be galvanized into action, because now is the time, as the saying goes, if not now, when?